Hello, I am your father. Welcome back to part two of GM Tips. GM Rick here with a sense of humor and a weirdness that is unparalleled. Yes, I am. I'm okay. Yeah. Have you guys ever noticed that about me? I am okay with who I am. I am very comfortable in my own skin. You can call me a geek, a dork, a dweeb. I am cool with it. Call me any name you want. Well, there are a few exceptions. You call me a few things that are just false, derogatory, and defaming. That I get upset with. And usually it's in the dad arena. So, But other than that, I'm cool with whatever you want to call me. Call me GM Dork if you want. I like it. Um, I am proud of who I am, thank you. I really am. I've spent 49 years getting here, so deal with it. <laughs> All right, now on to GM tips. Sorry, got off track here. I do that sometimes. You guys whack me upside the head when I do. All right, so we did stage one and stage two. Stage one and stage two of this were real simple. It's number one, the prep work. So you got to do the brainstorming, stage one. Then you got to do stage two, sketching your plot and really sketching things out. Now, those are two of the key parts to getting things going when you're a GM. And no matter the RPG system, really laying out the framework for um, designing and planning your campaign. Stage three is recording wants and needs. Now, this goes back to some things we've talked about in other videos. But after you have a mental and physical picture of the campaign you want to run, record your decisions and the work you've done. Write down that you want to write down what you want, and it helps you solidify your vision before you start developing the characters that the players want to play, helping them to develop that, um, the NPCs, and finding names. So you've got to sit down and kind of put a want versus a need. Uh, grab a sheet of paper and then split it in two columns. A lot of people have taught you to do this in other areas of your life. You're going to label one column needs and another one want, okay? And you're going to make a list including what you need book-wise, adventure-wise, physical framework-wise, um, maps, plot hooks, characters. And on the other hand, you're going to put want. These are the pie-in-the-sky things. So maybe you'd love to have, oh, I don't know, a never-ending story that keeps going on and on and on. Maybe you want to have, um, oh, oh, what are they, Dwarven Forge pieces to put down for scenery because you love how the Dwarven Forge stuff looks and your characters will too. Um, maybe you want to contain it to only 10 sessions where the characters may want to take it 30. Okay. These are once. And these are things that you got to keep in mind. Now, when you're done, review both lists and figure out if you need to make any last-minute changes. Give yourself a brain break. Go walk away, grab a cup of coffee, a cup of tea, a scone, whatever you want to have, and then come back to your list a few hours later, maybe a day later, maybe a two later, and then re-review it and see if you've left anything off. Once and needs, the needs are things that you're going to have to have for that campaign to flow. You don't have dice, you're in trouble. You don't have um, character sheets, you're in trouble. Maybe you don't need miniatures, but you'd like to have them because they sure look cool and they sure keep the players focused on what, what's going on around them so that they know where everything is. Maybe you want certain types of miniatures. Maybe you want a Red Manus Assassin. Maybe you want uh, an Alchemist, or a Half-Elf Alchemist figure. And you got to paint them, so these are once. But these are things that you put on that list that if you can get to them, you get them. If not, they're just a want and not necessary to absolutely making it happen. Now you go to the outline. So you've asked yourself the questions. You put down the, the plot ideas and kind of given yourself a framework there. You put down the wants and needs. Now you're turning it into a campaign. So after you're satisfied with your list, you're ready to finish, put the finishing touches and begin the prep work. And the prep work can take a while. Um, you're outlining your vision, but what you're doing in doing this, and, and so often we do this, GMs, we just go and start writing down whatever our little fancies pull to, and then, and then we keep writing and writing and writing and writing, 
And a year and a half later, we've got the concept of what we really want to do. But we've wasted a year and a half. Don't do that to yourself. Putting the milestones, planning things out, laying things out, gives you an idea of whether something is possible or not. It shows you how much time you're going to have to put in. It gives you an outline that moves things forward. If you don't have these things, you're not going to get things done. So, switching organization structural uh, structure for the finished version of your plot from a picture, like maybe it's a spider web, to an outline can give you more clarity. So you got your spider web that you kind of laid out. Maybe you let, labeled the little nodes and all the other things that we talked about, or the branches. But instead of doing that, maybe you come to a harder outline that you can put into your book, like what I've given you before. Um, God, where did I put it? Oh, there it is. Hey, like this. So now you're taking it and you're putting it in here. So like I've done. You want to see some of the structuring that I did with things. Um, uh, okay, so lost cities and ruins. So I outlined that. But I had to have the web in order to get me there. I just couldn't do that on my own. Now, I also did campaign things. So I do a campaign sheet. Now, some of you guys love these things. Some of you don't. Here's a campaign sheet. And I put important locations, important things. Why did I do that? Because, and I put my character stuff, so Sil the monk, um, Brian had um, a gear forged, uh, Paul has Meg the hobgoblin, Max has not a name yet, but he is a Norgorborite type of thing. I put down what I know people are going to want to run. Why do I do that? So that when I'm doing my campaign ideas, I can look at the characters and see some of the background and pull that into the threads of the web. Um, to reorganize your information, use a scene-by-scene -scene structure that shows you an ideal path you'd like to narrate during the section. So maybe you do pieces of paper that's each scene, and you take them and you have 25 or 30 or 40 or 50 scenes. And now you've got those laid out, kind of like the campaign sheet. It's your, she it's your scene sheet. And you're laying it out, and you're doing the things, and you're laying out the key directions and things. Again, it's much more of a linear campaign. It's much more having some subplots, like we talked about, not the branching, but some subplotting. And that's okay. Some of you like that structure. For me, I may go with the branches, and my scenes are branches that add to each other. And I'm trying to branch it out. Um... Then you can add optional scenes and mark them clearly as optional. That's the branching concept, where you're laying optional scenes out. There are subplots that they can go take that lead them to the next one. And then story rewards and milestones should be written down as well. Are there things your players want to accomplish? Now, with the branching idea, this is going to change, and that's going to become a fluid thing because those rewards and milestones could change depending on which direction the players go. So... Week to week, you may be changing this. Again, I'm adding stuff that isn't on this in the, the Cobalt Press ideas. And it's no offense uh, to Monica, because Monica is a great writer. The things she's laying out here are really good. I'm just adding some things from the other books and my thinking that will give you a little more of an expansion to it. Um, so the four stages challenge you about how to build your campaign. Now, I'm going to add in some optional fifth and sixth stages, all right? The fifth stage, write out a path with your players' objectives. So, like I told you in this campaign, I've got several people in this campaign. So let's go to my plot campaign things, all right? I'm going to go back to my campaign sheet here. Give me a second to do that. I just passed it. And that's horrible that I did that because there it is. All right, so this campaign sheet. Let's go back to the campaign sheet for a minute and end this. And, and by the way, this is a blank campaign sheet. You can take it and scratch out Pathfinder if you want. That's fine. Uh, you will find it out on the Paizo website, but it is a good resource to have no matter what the system. All right. So let's take Meg, the Hobgoblin. All right, Meg came from the Iron Claw tribe. She was enslaved by that tribe over in Tiencia and sent over 
on a ship to serve as some things that probably you guys won't be too happy with. She was great, as I call it, because people don't like the R word. Um, that's his concept, and I'm okay to flow with it. Again, not a great subject, but it builds on who she is. She became stronger because of it and is now trying to forge her way to strength as a kineticist, a hydrokineticist. So now I build a structure that has Meg's specific plot. So that means you've got to go back and, and print out and ask your players for that information. Paul provided me with two pages to three pages of information. I appreciate that. He took some real time, and I don't want to discount this. So in this campaign, I want to put subplots that are specific to his, Meg's, desires. Now I'm going to do the same thing with Syl. Syl is a monk who went from being evil to neutrality. Or actually, no, is slipping towards evil from neutrality. And is having a hard battle from lawful neutral not to go lawful evil. But she's she's battling in herself the disappointments, the she was never good enough. She was just a violent war taking monk that committed horrific acts. Will she go good? Will she go evil? I don't know. But I gotta plot out the plots for either direction of what she could do, right? Um same thing with Max. Max's character, once again, a half-breed. He likes to do a lot of half-breeds. His mother was made into a tool of the Empire, and he's mad about it. So he wants the current Empire brought to its knees, and he will use whatever terroristic tactics to do it. Again, broaching a subject. It's a, this campaign is going to broach a lot of subjects that I haven't broached before and very deep subjects. So how are we going to deal with it? Well, as a GM, I don't have anybody at the table who's going to object to it, so I'm going to explore these things um, with, a, with an even hand and not in a mean way. But again, you've got to make sure, even as you do these plots, that your players are going to be okay with where you can take it. Um, so another thought. Sixth, where do you want to allow your players to go in the world? And that goes into the initial things that we were talking about with the scenes and stuff. But you gotta you got to put some things there. Of, are you unlimited in your boundaries? Will you let them go anywhere? Will you let them go off-world? Will you let them go dimensional? Will you let them go to hell? Will you let them go to heavens, Elysium, um, to a far dimension of Cthulhu? <coughs> you have to decide where the boundaries are. Now, again, as a GM, you may not want to confine your players. Okay, so where are the possibilities they could go? And that's where you make this fluid, and you're going to have to do some fluid planning. Where would you let them go, and where won't you let them go? And you got to write these things down so you have your boundaries set. And so even when the players broach those boundaries, you say, fine, whatever way you want to go. Or you say, no, nah, I really don't want you going there, because this could get way out of hand. And I kind of want to keep some semblance of, a structure around it, not being hard and fast, but I do want to keep some semblance. And your players will either respect you and enjoy that, or they will go nutty on a fruitcake and you'll let them go whatever direction and it just goes all over the map. It's okay whatever way you want to do. You have to decide this ahead of time. And that's not in the prep stuff. And, and sorry, Monica, I'm adding a little bit to your stuff. And, and, and Wolfgang, I'm adding a little bit to the book. But this is where I would put some add-ins on just different things where it goes a little bit beyond. Um, do you allow organized religion in your world or not? Or do you allow atheism as a religion? Do you allow, again, these are some real world concepts, but it affects the boundaries of that world. Is it a world without religion? Is it a place without religion? How anti-religion are they? How pro-religion are they? Is it gonna throw in some hooks and things that aren't there? Again, this goes into the planning ahead where you have to kind of say yes, no, maybe. Um, my players, two of them lean a little more religious. Two of them don't. Actually, three and two. 
I am indifferent either way as a GM because I'm secure in what my belief is no matter what you play in the game. Very secure. So, but each player has a little bit different spin on it. And you got to make sure it's okay with everyone to have these type of settings. Um, the dogma can get heavy in the campaign. And you got to ask yourself, do I want the dogma? Do I not want the dogma? Do you want to broach subjects like LGBTQ subjects or not? That's up to you. But you have to sit and discuss it with your players ahead of time. I had a session, perfect example, Pathfinder Society. Two polyamorous players came in. And they told us, we're polyamorous. They're very outgoing about that. Can we run our players as polyamorous? Like, okay. Any objections? And they're like, no, no, no. I'm like, all right. We had so much fun and laughter because I let them do that. The, the, those two will walk away. They've never played. They played D&D &D 5e. They've never played Pathfinder. They had so much fun. They, they, the, the reason they had to leave was they had another event they had to go to. But they were loving it. They were there to the very ragged edge of when they had to go. And I wish I would have gotten to talk with them a little more. My uh, my fiance at the time, Kim, came up. We were talking. Um, but I wish we would have had more time. I really do. It was a good thing. So you've got to plan certain things in. And you have to decide which of these things are important to you and which of them are not. Um, I'm not going to tell you what to do in this because it's your world. Do what you want to. Do what you want but <laughs> I know you guys are laughing. Again, GM dork, having too much fun with this. But you have to plan this in. You have to decide. Talk it over with your players ahead of time, especially if it's a known group that you work with and you know how they're going to feel. Plan this in with them. Otherwise, what's going to happen is you're going to have your vision and it's not going to be what they want. And really, like we talk about, the players are the ones who write the stories, not us. We write the framework. We are developing the framework of their story. But that's all it is. At the end of the day, it is not our story. And it's a hard thing for a GM. We want it to be our story. Say it out loud. I want it to be my story, dang it. I spent the time. Say it. Because it's what you're thinking. Even if you say, no, no, I'm not. Yes, yes, you are. And just be honest with yourself. But in that honesty, say... But if I make it my story, is it going to be something that they're going to want? Do they truly enjoy that? Or do they not? Daddy, can I blow it out now? Yes, go around and blow it out. Candle, pumpkin candle. She loves these things. It's pumpkin pie candle. Come, blow it out. Big puff. <gasps> Come on, hit that thing. Harder. Blow hard. Good girl. It's making fun. It is. So, this is what this is the fun you get in these things. It's that fun. That's smoke. Go on, go play. Go on, smoke. <laughs> Jeez, I love the child. <laughs> she is so innocent and full of life, and yeah. And there's moments she drives me to in her fruit cake. Don't ever think that doesn't happen. But back to the thing. You've got to be honest with yourself. You do want it to be your story. You are a GM for a reason. And when you're honest about that, then you can work to make it their story. Because then it becomes their story. It becomes it. Especially when they shift your world. Especially when they throw whatever plan you had on its head. And there's nothing you can do to stop it other than just roll with the punches. It is their story. And that's okay. It is okay. Say it with me. It's okay to let the players write the story. In fact, it's more fun that way sometimes. It's okay. And, you know, sometimes we have to cede control. And that's the hardest thing. Because we like to have a structure around us most days. Most of us. And that structure, when that's bent sideways, bothers us to no end. Instead of enjoying the moment that is what they create. And that's where the real fun is. I, I loved doing the one shot um, with DM Dystrus, Tiny GM, Akisha, and the rest. It was greatness. So keep that in mind. It makes it fun. 
All right, got to grab this call. Have a great week, and see you next time on GM Tips.